I'm Robert Scoble and we're at the Stanford University School of Engineering and we're getting a look at self-driving cars, solar cars, and cars that can outrace most every race car driver. <laughs> So who are you? I'm Sven Beiker. I'm the executive director of the Center for Automotive Research here at Stanford University. So, so what's the next part of the lab we're going to get well, to? The next project we should be looking at Junior, which is um, a sister vehicle of the one that competed in the 2007 Urban Challenge. And this is, if you will, the uh, computer science part of the autonomous driving research here at Stanford. Whereas this vehicle, again, doesn't really have a concept of obstacles in its way and so on. It's really looking a lot at vehicle dynamics. So the other part we are going to look at is, is really um, computer vision, uh, decision making, uh, probabilistic planning and all these things. And this is what uh, Mike is going to show us. Right. Who are you? Uh, my name is Mike Sokolsky, and I'm a research engineer with the Stanford Artificial Intelligence Lab. And uh, I work as a uh, systems integrator for Junior, the car behind us. And what is this thing that's spinning? And <laughs> um, so the, the thing on spinning is on top is a uh, laser scanner, um, and I'll talk about it in a second. Um, the project itself, so Junior is an autonomous car. Um, basically, it means that it's supposed to do everything by itself. You don't need to touch anything. Um, the very high level picture is if you think about a GPS device, um, right now you can plug in a place where you want to go in your GPS and it tells you how to get there. And the extension that we want to realize is you plug in where you want to go and then it takes you there. And that's sort of the interface that we want ultimately to be able to interact with our cars with, just sort of sit back, relax, and it takes care of all the driving for you. Um, tell me a little, give me a little history of the, the, of the Stanford sure. projects, because we were here in 2007 and interviewed Mike, and I forget his last name, Mono Merlo, yep. and he wrote a lot of the software that's probably still running in this car, right? Yep. Um, so the history at Stanford, um, originally this came in, there were two uh, grand challenges by DARPA, and these were these 250-kilometer uh, across-the-desert races in the southwest of the country the first year. Um, Stanford wasn't a participant in that, um, and the, the, I think the leading vehicle went about eight or nine miles into the track before all of them got eliminated. And the next year was much more successful, um, and at that year, the entry from uh, Stanford, which was the first really year that Stanford had been involved in this sort of stuff, took first prize. Um, and this was in a Volkswagen Targ, like the car behind you, um, and that one is currently in the Smithsonian, Smithsonian Museum. Um, and the two years after that was the Urban Challenge, which is what this car, or the copy of this car, was entered in. Um, and there we took second place. Um, and since then, there have been no more of these uh, DARPA challenges, and there hasn't been a big way for all the different groups who are doing this sort of research to come together. But we've refocused, and we're looking at the problem of how do we expand this to make it actually work on real roads with real problems and to interact with a dynamic environment where there's lots of very big unknowns, including things like construction, and you can't rely on the roads being the same every time you come back, and you have to be able to adapt to all these changing situations. Yeah. And it, are, are, is Stanford working with the Google car? Because a lot of the, the stuff was developed here and a lot of the team members came from here, right? So a lot of the, the team members um, at Google are Stanford graduates. And uh, Sebastian Thrun, who's the professor here, is also involved in the Google research. Um, but the Google research is a Google initiative. Okay. So you guys aren't sharing uh, road data or, or imagery algorithm, you know, these decision algor algorithms anymore, right? Um, there is, um, the, the code base is very similar between the two teams. So we moved to the back of the car to get a better, better angle, and it's quite apparent that there's almost a data center in the back of this car. <laughs> so it's a little bit different from your standard trunk. Um, when you get a chance to see the inside of the car, it actually looks very much like a standard car. The back seat has a couple of computer monitors and keyboards, um, which is maybe a little not standard, but the front is almost identical to a normal car, and you can fit five people in it for if they're large. Um, but the trunk is completely full of all this electronic equipment. Um, and we've got two big computers back here. Um, and they're not, they're, they're a very high-end machine, but they're nothing extraordinary. They cost, I don't know, two or $3,000 new. So they're nothing fancy. And we've put a lot of effort into making sure that the software we write 
is scalable and works sort of incrementally. So you don't need to worry about massive data. There's already a huge amount of data which comes in from all the cameras and sensors and from the laser on the roof. And to integrate all this in is a big effort in and of itself. And so we try to keep things as simple as possible and solve problems with sort of the minimal effort so we don't require what would be an actually massive data center back here. Um, there are the two computers, and there's a lot of stuff in the racks, but it's almost all just supporting equipment, um, the interface to the car and some power distribution. Um. Now, unlike my car, my car has no idea I'm standing next to it. This car actually watched us walk around the car, didn't it? Yes, absolutely. Um, so we track uh, vehicles, pedestrians, and bicycles, and we know when there's a pedestrian versus when there's a bicycle um, and can predict where they're going to go. And everything else we also keep track of, right now we're not identifying things. So if you see a dog, it's just kind of a generic thing. But the car is aware of it and is tracking it and keeping an eye on it. And it's in a full 360 degree view all the time around the car. And this is one of the big, big advantages that it has over human because we have very limited attention. Um, we've got a limited field of view. We can only focus on one thing at a time. And the car is constantly just keeping track of everything that's going around you. And this is a great place to um, see where you will actually begin to see this showing up in production vehicles because technologies developed from this will be able to alert you to things. You're already starting to see blind spot alerts in cars and things where they monitor stuff that you can't keep track of all the time and then just fi focus on finding a way to feed that into people that gives them the alerts when they need it and otherwise they don't have to worry about it. No, that's true. I have a, a Toyota Prius that has radar in the front of it. Now it doesn't have this cool radar. So, so talk to me about this laser, this spinning thing on the on the top of the car. It's called a lidar, right? So it's a lidar scanner, um, and it's uh, basically laser beams. They're invisible, um, and they're perfectly safe for your eyes. So you don't need to worry about this driving around and having to shield your eyes. Um, but it shoots out 64 of these beams, and each one goes out, hits something, and bounces back. And it times how long it takes for that to happen. And it's a very, very short amount of time, but it can measure that. And from that, it knows how, how long it took and therefore how far away things are. And so it has 64 of these beams, and they're sort of arranged like this, sort of starting straight out and then slowly incrementally downward at different angles. And as this sweeps around, it sort of carves out all these points in space around the car. And so we get a million points back every second from this sensor, which gives you this full detailed 3D map of everything that's around the car. How fast is it spinning? It seems like it's uh, one, uh, five times a second somewhere. It's spinning about 10 times a second. Um, so you get 10 full revolutions, 10 full frames every second, and you can track things at that rate. Um, now, when I, uh, you can go and watch video of the LiDAR, and we'll probably put that in here. That's a lot of data coming off that sensor, isn't it? It's a lot of data. There's even more data coming from the cameras. We have uh, quite a few high-resolution cameras. On top of the uh, LiDAR unit, there's an omnidirectional camera, which gives you a full 360-degree view in video to complement the uh, range data. And so all of this comes together, and we've got a bunch of hard drives in the back to store all of this data as it comes in. Okay. Do you store all of that data, or do you try to filter it down and, uh, com or compress it somehow? Um, so we compress it as much as possible. Um, it's not feasible to store all the data. Um, we don't have, like it would take a full-time engineer to take care of managing all this stuff. It's a pretty complicated problem. So we tend to store data from specific runs that we're interested in. And when people want to collect a data set, we'll go out and figure out what, the, what we want to include in this information. Um, and then every time we run the car, we do store everything that's happening. And if there's something that we want to go back and look at, we can keep that. Um, but it's all sort of done by hand, um, and we throw away stuff that isn't relevant. And that's why, so I have some of the first video of the Google car because I was driving along it. I, I thought it was a cool looking car and took some video, but I had no idea it was driving itself. Mostly I thought it was a mapping car. I thought it was, I thought it was uh, making a map of the road for the Google Maps team. Right? Um, so we actually do make maps. Um, we go out and we'll have someone driving behind the wheel. Um, one thing I should mention is that we always have someone behind the wheel, and there's a sort of a takeover button. So even when the car is driving by itself, we often get people saying, oh, well, you're not really driving by itself. There's someone behind the wheel. Well, do you really want to see a car with no one in it driving down the road with you? If anything goes wrong, there's nothing that can be done. And so we're always very careful to have a safety driver who's in, in control of the vehicle. 
No, uh, in Europe, I saw a taxi that was driving itself. Uh, so in, in some countries, they're pushing the boundaries in, of this? In some countries, you're pushing the boundaries. Um, I think it's a question of how much you feel you can get away with. And there's a big question, which, I mean, everyone in this um, field of research is sort of waiting to hear the answer to, which is what happens when the first one of these things fails and causes an accident. And I mean, as they become more and more prevalent, this will happen. And I think, uh, in my mind at least, the important thing is that ultimately they will be significantly safer than humans. And you have to sort of look at the trade-off. Like, you're always very afraid of plane crashes. They're extremely rare, but you're not in control when that happens. And it's sort of a similar thing. You have to be able to make it safe enough that people feel that it's an obvious benefit. Today, how much would this car cost? The, the LiDAR, for instance, is... Uh, a new one is $29,000, but this one was $75,000. Yeah, there are a couple different models and kinds. Um, the sensors on this car total um, about $300,000. Um, and, of course, this is significantly more than the car itself. Um, but the hope is that in the future, the cost of these will come down. And also, the amount of data you need will come down. Because right now, we're using a huge amount of data. And... Um, if you can cut down how much information you need to process and you get better algorithms and better software, the computer aspects of this are just going to keep getting cheaper and cheaper and cheaper. And we've sort of seen that as a Moore's law. Um, and if you can bring the hardware costs down to a point where you can use hardware, especially cameras and things, which are quite cheap now, um, and as there's more demand for LiDAR, that cost will, that will keep coming down. And hopefully, at some point, that'll reach a point where you can actually include it on cars. Do you th have a feeling for, is this going to be 5 or 15 years away? Do you guys have an idea of when this is going to be commercialized so we can buy it in a regular car? So I think this is the billion-dollar question. Um, there are a lot of different answers to it. I've heard everything from 5 years to never going to happen. Um, it's, well, clear it's clear it's going to happen. It's, it's clear it's going to happen. It's somewhere in between. Um, y researchers tend to be pretty overly optimistic about when they're actually going to see their stuff in production. But I would say in the next 10 years, you're going to start to see a lot of these technologies showing up more and more as standard, just because purely the safety increases with the radar and cameras monitoring lanes and blind spot detection. And as, it's, as you're able to incorporate more software to do more autonomous stuff, that'll happen. And in the 10 to 20 years out, we're going to start to see actual production cars where some portion of driving maybe even slightly before that, will be autonomous and in the 10 to 30 year range, I imagine. Yeah, my, my Toyota Prius already has a camera that looks at lane markings and keeps you in the lanes and stuff like that. In some way, I think the technology is going to come along much faster than both the legal issues and sort of societal acceptance because you're going to have to convince people to give up driving their car everywhere and some people are going to be extremely reluctant to do that. I talk to a lot of people and especially when you're not in this field, we sort of lose sight, but you talk to people and they say that sounds terrifying <laughs> and there's a lot to overcome in terms of that can we learn about your research on the web somewhere do you do you publish uh videos or or papers so, so we have a bunch of videos and i'm in the process of setting up a youtube channel so hopefully within the next month by um definitely by the end of 2010 we'll have a bunch of videos up of stuff we're working on um, we have a website which is a bit out of date unfortunately um but also, there, if you're interested in the research we're doing, there are plenty of publications throughout various uh, AI and robotics journals um, that you can see some of the work. Well, thank you so much. Yep. Thank you.